speak to it. And maybe two more practical things. If, if you haven't been with us the last days, it's not a problem. We will not continue with the guacamole recipe from day one and day two. So if you don't have it or it, it ended up being different, then in the lesson, it's not a problem. Today we start fresh. We will still stay in the cooking regime, but we will uh, create new, new recipes together. Also, I wanted to say is that today we will need SSH to work. Some of you have experienced trouble yesterday when you try to clone or push changes. Today we will need it. However, if, if your SSH connection doesn't work, I would still encourage you to stay in the workshop and listen. You will, there will be good learning. It will be a pity if people disconnect only because the SSH connection somehow set up didn't work. Okay, we are super perfectly on time and I think I didn't forget any practical things. Um, we wanted to start first connecting a bit to yesterday, uh, clarifying some concepts. Here I go into the concept in collaboration. And I will make more space. Later I will need a terminal, but not at this moment. And I will zoom in. And yesterday we have uh, seen clone, but we didn't really explain what it does. Also, we have seen push. We didn't really explain what's really going on. Today we want to give these terms an understanding. Just watching here the collaborative document, watching for questions that we should raise. Um, motivation, it's what Marine uh, pointed out. We want to now learn tools so that we can collaborate using it from small projects to big projects. And we, the, the central idea today will be, will be code review, reviewing code written by somebody else. And that is useful already for projects with two people. I would say it's essential for projects with more than, more than one person. And we will come back to that. But first, let's, let's clarify some of the concepts that, we, that were flying around yesterday and we didn't really explain what, what was going on. From day one and day two, we, we have been using the word repository a lot. Repository is the, the Git project. It contains all the commits, all the branches. And all of this thing, it's called repository. And here in this graphics, that's this box. And in this box, there are these colored rectangles and they represent commits, changes. And then we see here there are multiple branches. So there is the branch master and the branch experimental and the branch idea. And branches, they, we use them as independent development lines. Uh, technically, they are, there is, the one is not more important than the other. So from Git's perspective, they are all branches. But as humans, we often agree that master or main is our is the main development line. And then we we either work just on that or we work on on side branches with some ideas before we are sure that they should be integrated with the main code. And whereas branches were a bit optional when working on your own, because when working on your own, maybe you just want to have one master branch. Now that we start collaborating, that will be very important because as soon as we collaborate with other people, we always we will always work on separate branches. Yeah, but uh, rather than, but when we work individually, it's also nice to have branches, right? To have a separate uh, development ideas and all. Yeah, I like them. So I I often have more than one branch. Often I have like two or three branches. And especially for something half finished, then I like to put it on a branch. Good. I need to make just one change here on my computer. 
And here is the committee's the most robust thing in the Git perspective and branch is not that or how do you say that like you mean that a commit or is doesn't change once created yeah yeah and branches so as we add new commits branches move with the commits but then we also see this v10 here and that that is an example of a tag a tag technically looks like a branch it's, it's like a sticky note on a commit, but it doesn't move. And then, oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, what is the use case of tag if it's uh, like a, a branch? And uh, when are we supposed to use tag? Oh, tag is useful if I want to, like here I see v, v10 pointing at a specific commit. And I want to have a way to find this commit in a way that I can remember. Like I don't remember, this C7F0 for the characters, that's hard to remember, it's hard to communicate. If I want to tell you over the telephone what which version you should use, I will have a hard time giving you this over the telephone, but it will be easy for me to say you should get the V10 version. And so it's like a it's like a milestone, it's like a way marker. But I like to think of it as a commemorative plaque you know, that sometimes you see on on the house walls. Now we put this nice com like here. 120 years ago, this and this comet happened, and this this will be there forever, and we can find it again. Good. And then uh, two more concepts that we will use a lot today: cloning, forking. Cloning we have seen yesterday, but only very briefly. And when we clone, we copy the entire repository, all the branches, all the tags, all the commits. We typically clone them to our laptop, desktop, computer, and then we take copy of everything. It copies all the commits. It will actually change the name of the branches. So now instead of instead of idea, it's called origin idea. Instead of experimental, it will be called origin experimental. And what is the origin? Origin is refers to where did the, where was this cloned from. It's the origin of the clone. So that's cloning, but then we will I think to, yesterday we didn't talk about forks, but today we will. So there, there we can not only clone, we can also fork. It's it's technically very similar. Again, we copy everything, but we don't fork from GitHub or GitLab onto our laptop. Rather, we we make a copy that stays on GitHub, but then under maybe my username. So then I can make changes to it. So that's the difference between a clone and a fork. So the fork is uh, at the cloud space and uh, clone is at, uh, in our local laptop or yeah. computer. Yes. So um, probably nice to mention that when we fork a clone and after the main repository uh, had more commits, that might not be or that will not auto sync uh, to the fork or clone. That's very important. Yes, very important. And it's maybe not. Um, so when people start cloning and forking, sometimes they expect that after I cloned, changes happen here. They don't automatically come to my laptop. And also changes that I do on my laptop, they don't automatically uh, go on GitHub. We will do this actively. So we will do these with commands. And same is for the fork. Once you have forked or copied a repository, they don't stay in sync on their own. You have to synchronize if you want to, or you can just leave the copy there. But they they are independent repositories after they have been forked or cloned. That's a very important point. Thanks for pointing it out. Yeah, and also we can clone from a fork directory to a forked uh, repository to a local laptop. Like... Indeed, and this is actually probably in this is what we would do so instead of instead of cloning the this repository which maybe i don't have access to um, i can read it but maybe i cannot write it <clears throat> so the, the first step would be create a fork now i can read and i can write and maybe instead of cloning the this central repository we will come back to that i would clone the the forked repository 
Excellent. And then we have a few more things, but we don't want to spend too much time, but they will, the terms will show up, especially for the team leads when you later create the exercise repositories. So there are other ways to make a copy of a repository, and one is to generate a repository from a template. And we use these for these exercises. And it's, it works a bit like a, it's like a cookie cutter. So when you, uh, when you bake cookies for I don't know, Christmas, um, there are these metal cookie cutters. So you can, if you want many repositories to be similar, to start with a similar structure, you could create a template. And from this template, from this cookie cutter, cut similar looking repositories. Uh, what you will then see is that it, it takes this template, but flattens it to one commit. How can this be useful? This can be useful not only in our workshop later, but this can be useful in your group if you want all students to have a good starting point and, and start a repository from a certain structure. Then you can create a template and they, they can get started from the template. And then there are other ways to copy and move repositories around. You can import from GitLab to GitHub and from GitHub to GitLab and from some other server to yet another server. So this is another way to, to copy repositories around. But the, the important thing that we want to keep is cloning and forking. And this is, so Tanya specified this, or that after we have cloned, after we have forked, these repositories do not automatically synchronize. We have to synchronize. And the way we do it is we use pull and push. By pulling, we pull changes from a remote repository, which can be on GitHub, for instance. Uh, by pushing, we do the opposite. Do we have somewhere here pull and push? No, we don't. But the, by pushing, we could then push changes that we did on the laptop and we want to publish them on GitHub. So then I would push them to my, to my fork. Okay, looking at the questions. Mm -hmm. What oh, was this somehow clear? Should we should I clarify any of these terms more? Should we move on to to the next episode? Yeah, I, uh, I think all the questions are asked here. Is there anything regarding SSH? We need to make sure. Yeah, SSH. Um, maybe we should. Add, how can we find the so if people still want to install it and set it up, how can they find it? Maybe we can put it on the collaborative document. We have um, uh, our install instructions for SSH. We will need that in a little bit less than one hour from now. And the SSH part, we need to for the pushing, sometimes also for the pulling, because then GitHub needs to know whether I'm really me. So it, I need to authenticate that it's, it's me and that I have permissions to, to change it. And it does it based on my public SSH key. I will now move on to the next episode. Yeah. And I don't know, Dania, whether you want us to have the screen or do you want to take it from me? Do you, because now you, you take the microphone and I will ask you questions. Yeah, probably you can share it. We don't need to uh, mm -hmm. share it. So now, um, now we will go to the central uh, workflow. Um, now what we want to do it here is we want to collaborate. We want to collaborate on a same uh, repository. So um, see that uh, now what we do uh, want to have it's a kind of uh, layout that Radovan is sharing it uh, here, where this um, red boxes uh, stands for central repository, which contains it uh, inside it has its own branches and commits. And these uh, blue boxes are uh, 
the collaborators copy in their own uh, laptop, uh, like local copies, which is cloned from the central repository. Um, what would be the difference between these uh, clone uh, repositories and the central repository uh, in Git perspective? I guess there is not much difference, uh, but uh, there will be this origin with a label will be there in the clone uh, clone uh, repositories in the local laptop, uh, like because it's cloned from the central repository that Radovan mentioned origin refer to the um, web's reference where the repository was cloned. And um, so, and all, it, uh, yeah. Uh, I can also hear that, that that's a really important point that um, uh, that the, so you made the important point is that these repositories are in principle equivalent. So each of these has all the commits and uh, branches. Um, which also means that on this picture, you have like six backups of your repository. And you have, you have also answered the question, like, how do these know where they came from? They, they carry this origin and origin is this one then. And how does this repository know that it's central? Like what is, what is special about it? Uh, it's a collaborators uh, that uh, decide that this is where we were going to collaborate. Or in Git perspective, there is not much uh, difference, I guess. Uh, and especially the clone cloned repository will have this origin where they cloned. Is there any other uh, that I uh, forget to mention regarding this? No, I think that's it. So yeah. this the, the fact that we call it this red and call it central, it was a couple of people agreeing on it. So it was not, there is nothing really more special about this. Yeah. This is typical for small scale projects or uh, the workflow we follow at Code Refinery and uh, our other organizations. Uh, is any uh, specific use case you want to mention regarding this uh, workflow, Radovan? Um, so what is important here is that this, we will practice this later. Uh, I believe it will be then after the first break. Mm -hmm. um, what is for this to work, well, everybody, all the developers need to have write permissions to the central repository. And, and we will set that up. And they may be part of the same group or same organization of a project, like we are in the code refinery project. Yes. So we all have the right permission to the central repository and we make uh, clone it and we make changes and we will go through this uh, workflow uh, of, uh, within a couple of minutes, I guess. Uh, yep. So here, all these collaborators can contribute changes to the central repository. That's and right. Mostly, uh, this is a best practice is, uh, is to have the central repository, repository right protected. Uh, right protected, yeah, that doesn't mean that we could not write because we can do it not directly. It's a uh, due procedures. We can write it uh, that we will do with the pull request uh, that um, we have mentioned earlier. And uh, that's always nice to have uh, this kind of a due procedure rather than uh, writing directly to the central repository. Yeah. And this connects to this is what Marine yeah. mentioned. So, what we, what we will set up is that we will have a code review and we want to review changes before they go into the main branch. And I like to emphasize that it's not, it's not just about the quality. It's also, it's, it's especially about the learning because then at least two people know about the change instead of just one person. Yeah, and there will not be, uh, should not be, not be any hierarchy. Like it's everyone is equal. Uh, kind of power, not someone who should uh, do this. And it's it's like part of the group. Everyone can uh, should be able to uh, review and uh, put suggestion on this. This is how a good repository workflow works, right? That's a good point. So should a, is it a good idea if so? Should the reviewer always be more senior than the submitter? 
not necessary like not really uh, because everyone should be able to because if i if i could review something from uh, my senior i put it's a learning experience for myself and it's a bit more sharing work uh, work and it's also uh, put this uh, workflow and the repository more uh, equally distributed mm -hmm. And how do you prefer like to have a review from everyone, anyone from your project or it's like? Yeah, I also like that everybody should be able to review. Of course, there might be changes that um, certain people are more familiar with than others, but I like that nobody is more equal than others. Um, I like also the idea that, I don't know, master students reviews the changes of a professor. Why not? Um, it's it's good learning, and and, so, and sometimes it's the master student who has then who knows the latest tools and the latest the best language uh, design principles. So why why and, not? And also the master students can suggest something to the professor's uh, pull request or uh, change uh, if there is uh, like something that can it's uh, it should not it it's not supposed to be any kind of. Uh, uh, controlled uh, way it yeah. is uh, like a real flow of uh, work and how to put the changes mm. and so always a collaboration not uh, like a hierarchy mm -hmm. so shall we show our code refinery uh, repository for as a, re a real life example here uh, rather than how it looks like yeah let's do that so i will follow this link we have all our repositories are sitting on GitHub. I will follow this link. What do we see? We have 141 repositories. Let um, us go to this uh, last and material uh, and see. Yeah, yeah, there is the workshop page. If you see mistakes, you can fix them. Uh, but this one is interesting, Git Collaborative, because this is the, this is the Git repository. Um, that we are right now looking at. So this is the lesson. And, and later we will learn how we can send improvements. So then you can make suggestions and send improvements. That's always one of the best things. And if I look on insights here and network and browse a bit, we need to wait a second. And it's nice that we get many questions coming in. I'm watching them. I will comment on some of them. So here in this lesson, we typically all work within the same repository. The little dots that you see here are commits. And the differently colored lines, they represent different branches. So what we normally do. And the color doesn't mean anything. It's just uh, differentiating each yeah. branches. And the way we work is that if we if we want to make a change, we create a new branch, we create a commit, and then we there is the code review happening. Somebody's looking over it and it goes into the main branch. And the main branch is the that's what we are looking at right now. <clears throat> and I wanted to pick up a few questions from the collaborative document. Um there are, there are really good questions about the naming pull request. So that is historical and it's a technical term because this is how technically it's implemented. But let's let's imagine change proposals. Mm -hmm. There will be change proposals happening. Also, another good question was that we said, OK, we started here and then we cloned. And now all of these repositories develop on their own. They don't synchronize automatically. So how can we keep track of what's happening on the central repository? And, and we will see that later. But one way is this. I like to browse this network. So for any repository, you can open, for any public repository, you can open Insights Network and then browse and get updates. So that's one way to get to see what's happening in there. 
and uh, probably it's nice to mention about fork and clone uh, one more time. Like fork is always to the GitHub namespace uh, where you want to have a copy of this uh, central repository. Yeah. And we will have an exercise uh, after this session. And the first session is mostly the central workflow. Uh, but clone is you are cloning a public repository to your local laptop. And uh, mm -hmm. clone plus push doesn't mean fork. It's a different thing. Like yeah. you clone it and you create a branch and work on it and push it to the remote uh, repository. If it's a, if if you are a collaborator, you can do it directly to central repository and take make a pull request and someone review this and merge it to the central repository. Yes. Great. And uh, we can also for the moment we can. We can forget about the forks at least for the next one hour because we will yeah. only the first the next one and a half hours we focus on on this layout on on cloning and only later we will add one more level to it and then we add uh, forks and we also explain why do we do that like what is uh, because it adds a bit of complexity but why do we add this complexity but for the moment we don't have to worry so much about forking we we only have to understand clone pull and push uh, should we what else should we talk about here uh, um, should, mm -hmm. are we uh, did we explain all this concept uh, before we go for the exercise preparation we can have a little bit preparation and then come back after break and uh, um, discuss the goal of the exercise yes so what we want to do now in roughly 10 minutes is that we we explain what this exercise is about and what you need to do uh, yeah, oh, we and... will discuss the preparation first mm -hmm. and we'll take a break and come yes. back. Yeah. Should I take uh, or you will share the screen or? What do you prefer? You can also take the screen yeah. from me and browse it. Yeah, Whatever no, I can, I can just. Uh, uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Go ahead with the talking. So shall we go with uh, exercise preparation? Maybe uh part of team we will discuss how they they can prepare for the exercise first and during this time maybe the individual part uh participants following on stream they can relax a little bit and maybe ask more questions on, on the collaborative document it uh, sounds a good idea yeah and these steps that are highlighted here you can do them also after the break we we only now want to give the big picture in case something is missing so that you have time to communicate it. But we have planned so that also during the exercise time, you will have time within teams to, to set this up. Yes, and uh, if you want to follow up uh, us while uh, creating a template, you can do it as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then here, uh so each group uh we will call the team leads as the maintainer who is maintaining the central repository yes and everybody else is collaborator yeah and if you are in a team typically we recommend four five six it can be more uh, we know that we have also classrooms watching so then um, the team leads or a couple of helpers can be can have, take the maintainer role. Everybody else will be the collaborator role. And here, you then need to communicate your GitHub usernames with the with the chosen maintainer, so that they can add you. They will create an exercise repository, and they will add you as collaborator to the exercise repository, so that you can make changes to it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a team lead and you are watching together with some friends, one of uh, you can volunteer being a maintainer and others are collaborators. It's not mandatory that the team lead should be the uh, maintainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so team up with a few people and one of you will 
take the role of maintainer, the others can take the role of collaborator, use then we recommend to use screen sharing and do these things together. What should people do who are not part of a team? Uh, they should, uh, yeah. Are we not uh, going to show that uh, how to create the template or no? Yeah, maybe we can. So yeah. should I, uh, so now we, now we imagine we are the team lead, right? Yes, uh, the uh, people in the stream, they can relax and uh, check the hedge collaborative document or just watch it, uh, but we will come to the, uh, their session within a couple of minutes. Yeah, and sorry, not team lead, but maintainer, because you have pointed yeah. out that it doesn't yeah. have to be the team lead. So yeah. now, now we all imagine I'm the maintainer, I'm setting yeah. up this exercise for a group of people. What should I do? I should follow this link here, this one. It's a template. It's this cookie cutter, cookie cutter that I mentioned earlier. And therefore, it, it says that this is a public template and has this green button, use this template. And from this template, whoops, you can create the exercise for your team. Mm -hmm. And there we want to do create a new repository. When you create it, uh, please make sure that you create it under your namespace and uh, so not here. in. Yeah. By namespace, you mean owner of owner, the. Owner, yeah. 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 So in my case, it will be that's me. And I can, you can call it as you like, but I recommend that you call it just for consistency with our material. I would call it not template, but centralized workflow exercise. So the name doesn't really matter, but for consistency. Uh, this will be our exercise. repository and it should be public because you want this to be findable by your team colleagues but uh, private also can work but we uh, recommend public here right we recommend public the one thing that will not work in in private is if you then want to browse this network you want to see the commits and the branches and it looks really not neat you will not see that under private, but that's why I go for the public. Here, it doesn't matter what you select because there is only one. Uh, doesn't matter what you select. So I will, yeah, I can leave it off. We will only, in this exercise, we will work with one, one branch only as a starting point. And now, uh, so if I'm the team, if I'm the maintainer and I selected all these things, now I'm ready to create the exercise repository. Boom. Now it's generating it. So I'm going to be in your team now. So I'm sharing my username with you. Maybe you could add me as a collaborator. Exactly. So how do I add you as a how do I add you to this repository? Uh, settings, collaborators. So settings top right, collaborators on the left side. And now I need to know your GitHub username at people. So within your exercise groups, you need to communicate somehow. Yeah, uh, if you are in person, you can communicate like uh, with an notes or something. But in Zoom, if it's in Zoom room, you can send a private message to the maintainer or uh, to a, a Zoom message to everyone. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter since you are collaborating that everyone will know your username. So it's yeah. not. And do you want to tell me your username or? Yeah. I could, uh, you, you know that my username, my full name. Okay. Um, uh, I could uh, paste in. Is that you? Yeah. yeah, it's me. Good. So now I'm adding you to this repository. Now Dania can, oh, first of all, there is a pending invite. So now Dania go, got an email from GitHub saying that you got invited to this repository. Do you accept the invitation? Yes or no? And after you accept, you will have write permissions to it. And also, uh, you can get a notification on your GitHub uh, 
the bell icon. Mm -hmm. If you go further, you will get notified that uh, you. Oh, here on the you, bell. Yes. Yeah, you are invited to this workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I think we didn't really specify should people follow along or not. So the this is only for the maintainers, and even if you don't have to do it right now, you will have enough time to do it later. We only want to point out the important points, but there are also screenshots. Yes, this so is for thing, the team. Uh, team. This for the team. Yes. And then we also talk about this watching and watching. That is a little bit less important for smaller teams. It will be very important when we then when we collaborate with all the individual learners. So what is that? Here you can, on the watching and watching, you can select whether I want to have email notifications about all activity. In this case, in this case, maybe not because I, we don't want you to get over flooded with emails. So I would recommend to choose participating and mentions because then you get email notifications about your changes and discussions that you are involved with. But it's up to you. And you can see that I have uh, accepted your invitation to be a collaborator. Oh, you have. Okay, I need to reload. Okay. Yes, here we are. And what can I? Sorry. And I can. How do I know that you have right access? I think you have. Yeah, I think you have right right permissions now to the repository. Uh -huh. And um, should we show how to write protect the main branch, the master branch? Yeah, that would be good to show now. Because that's a good thing to do. So settings, we are still in settings now on branches. And it tells me my default branch is master. And I haven't protected any of my branches. So now any of the collaborators can git push directly to any of my branches. But here I want to protect master because we want any changes to master should go through code review. So add branch protection, branch name, master. And we want require a pull request before merging. And then you can even if this is a big project, you can even say that we, we require two people to approve. Here, we, we don't want to be too formal. I will unselect this. I only want to, I want to require pull request, but no other restrictions. So I keep everything. There's, everything. Mm -hmm. there's a good question, HackMD. Um, let people know when individual learners watching should be listening again, and doing things. And that's something I'm also not clear on. Is this only the team leaders that are doing this now? Or yeah, maintains? we will be back in like one minute and talk about, at least in my understanding, now we will also talk about individual learners. Is that right, yeah. Tania? Yes, so, yes. So if you are still here, then we are now, uh, we will also talk about individual learners in a minute. Yeah. And after that, so after we explain the setup, then we will go into a break. And after the break, we will start with the exercise. Okay, so back to back to here. Anything I forgot to say? I know uh, the unwatch and watch we already mentioned, but uh, if I'm I'm collaborating something with the two three people, I always would like to watch it. But uh, mm -hmm. for this exercise, uh, it would be nice to put and watching yeah. like it can be really educational to watch even a repository where you don't even work on but just to see how do other repositories how do they work how do they communicate it can be a project that you use uh, that can be really good learning from there yeah. but now let's also involve here let's engage the individual learners so what should they do following yeah, before on your that own? i also want to mention that uh, we are not forking here because in this exercise, uh, everyone will have this uh, read and write access to this uh, central repository. Correct. That's why we are uh, creating template for the team uh, teams and for individual learners, we will have a central repository where every 
individual will have right to access uh, if they send request to access. Mm -hmm. So forking, we will come back after this exercise and uh, discussion. Yeah. That's what other session. And now we will try something really ambitious and let's talk about individual learners following on their own because we also want to collaborate with you. We, we don't know each other yet, but we trust each other. We will try something really ambitious and work together on, on this exercise with, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 people. Let's see how it goes. So what should people do who follow on their own? What choices do they have? They have, uh, they can request access and choose one of the, uh, uh, only one repository to work with. We have recorder and uh, we have uh, the other one. Uh, the recorder we will be showing to uh, on the stream and it will be publicly available. If you don't want to uh, be seen your username, uh, you can choose the other. And yes. it's mm -hmm. that solely thing. Uh, other there is no other privacy issues it's just that we will be uh, showing it online because we want to also then discuss how how does one do code review and how do we review changes and we hope that at least some of you will choose the recorded one because we hope that we we have changes in there that we can together review later but you can choose so the not recorded one we will not even open here on on stream but, but of course, you can then still open it and you can then still participate there. Um, in order to get access to, to these repositories, you need to request it. We have colleagues who help um, adding you to the, the giving you right permissions. Then you are going to be the collaborator of one of these uh, yeah. repository. And it's so, so nice to mention the code of conduct here, uh, since we are going to show this. And also people work on the teams. It's also nice to follow the yeah. code of conduct. Uh, yes. Not to put any content uh, which make others uncomfortable. Good point, because we, and that's the improv part. We don't know what will happen here. We don't know which uh, changes we will see. But, um, and, and of course, at the end of the workshop, we will remove everything again, but still we want um, please push changes that like nothing weird so that um, no, that we, we respect the code of conduct here. I mean, this, the same thing is for the teams because we, we do now put changes onto public GitHub, even if we delete it later, but at least, I mean, this part will, will live on, on the recording. And also they can uh, unwash the repository after they get access uh, so that they don't get uh so many emails yeah and that's that's particularly important for following on your own because i i think it will be 50 or more people so then you don't want uh, to get 50 emails about everybody creating a new pull request so then then you switch this to participating in mentions i think we have mentioned uh, everything and probably time for a break we can come back with and to mention the goal of the exercise and uh, put people to give people to, uh, time to do the exercise. What do you think, Radovan? That's a great plan. So break after the break, we come back and we we tell you what the goal is. Oh, until when? Oh, what time should we resume then? Maybe ten past. Is that too? Ten past of, of ten after the hour that we will be back here explain the exercise and start. Yeah. Stop working? Yeah, I hope so. Good. Yeah. So break until 10 minutes past the hour. And then we will set you up for, for the exercise, which will then take half an hour. Yeah, you will have enough time to do that. Okay, thanks.
So uh, we have explained the exercise preparation now, Radovan. Did we miss something or? No, I think we didn't, but thanks also for the feedback that maybe we spent too much time on the preparation, but now we are all eager to actually start coding and yeah. we are about to start. So what is the goal of the of this exercise now? So the goal of the exercise is to have this uh, work collaborative. And so some uh, one of, uh, if you are in a team, one of you will be the maintainer and others will be collaborative and uh, collaborators. And if you are in a stream, you will be collaborators of our uh, code refinery workshop, uh, central repository. So our goal is to create uh, first clone this uh, group repository. Uh, if you are in a team from that, or in, if you are an individual partner, clone it uh, from our repository, you get access to and create a branch, create some new files and push this uh, branch uh, to the central repository and create a pull request. Step A to H, and we are not going to uh, elaborate these steps now. So this is uh, nicely written here and anyone can uh, read it further. So we will give 30 minutes to go further with this exercise. Mm, mm -hmm. is, is there something else that you want to add, uh, Radovan? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to emphasize so the exercise goes until <clears throat> including H. So you want to half an hour later, you want to be right here, but we will not we will not start it with the part two. Part two we'll we will do together at the same time. But what should people do who have time left? I think we can go through this uh, rest of the material. And... Yeah, so if you scroll down a little bit at the end of the page. So there's discussions, you can have a look at those, but the, we have optional exercises. So if you have time left in the, in the next half an hour, have a look at these optional exercises. Then we will come back and we will together do code review. Yeah, and if you are in a team, you are doing code uh, review within your team. Right. Yeah. Yes. There was a great question. Maybe we can just lift that one question out of the doc collaborative document. There was a great question, like if, what is a good way to review this material later? If for those who, are, who don't have time to follow now all the way through. And what we recommend is that if you can team up with somebody and go through this together. One, is, one person is the maintainer, one person is the, is the con contributor, collaborator. But even if there is no somebody else, you can you can go through these steps on your own, even inside your own repository. Try to open a pull request. Try to see how this looks from the co collaborator point of view and from the maintainer point of view. And if there is a, a need to fix SSH key, that you can always watch this uh, rather than going to fix it now, right? Correct. And it's, it's not a problem if you do don't do it uh, now, but you can watch it and do it later anytime. Yeah. So, so step A to H, half an hour later, so 45 minutes past the hour, we will restart the stream and discuss. And please uh, try to put something on the recorder a repository so that we can review it online if you wish to. Thanks. Have fun. Yeah. yeah. 30 minutes. Okay, Daniel, you have the microphone. Yeah, yeah thanks. So uh, we are done with the exercise, I suppose. Uh, should we have a uh, poll on the Hedgehog? How was it? Uh, that would be a good idea to know. Uh, That's a good idea. Step. Let us know whether this was too little time, too much time. Yeah. How it went. So, yeah. That's good to get your uh, feedback. What we have been doing now was um, like we clone uh, a repository and uh, create a branch and do, did some change. 
that when you have a branch or create, are you going to push a change to the central repository? Yeah, so I did how, like, as many of you did, I created a branch. In my case, it's, I call it my name and what I'm working on, it's status, so that I'm on this branch. And then I, on this branch, I created a file where I share a tool that I find useful. Mm -hmm. And I'm just about to, so I want to here show in a minute or two how we can create the pull request, which many of you have done. And then we will switch roles and we will all together review our pull request. So this commit that I did, oh, here, here we go, git, git show. This commit only lives on my computer because I didn't push it yet. So I will push it in a moment. But before I do that, I want you to notice this part here. I will. And this is one of the optional exercises. I will cross-reference the issue number 10, which I created, where I announced what I would do here, issue number 10. So what are the issues uh, for you? Like, is it some proposal to change or some work you want to do? So they can be used for issues. I mean, they can be used to, to report problems but they can also be used um, to communicate an idea before doing the coding mm -hmm. and getting feedback on the idea and informing others that I'm working on it. So uh, I also like to use issues this way here. I, this, so this is not a problem, but I open an issue where I inform everybody, this is what I'm working on and you can give me feedback. And later, a week later, a few months later, when my pull request then arrives, I can cross reference this discussion. Uh, when you create an issue and you want to work on it, uh, how do you uh, say to others that uh, you are going to work on it? Oh, the way I like to do it is that I self-assign. This way I signal to everybody that I'm actually working on it. Okay. But it's up to the project to decide how they want to communicate this. Yeah. So uh, you have pushed the changes and there are number for issues uh, and also the pull request. How do, how do the GitHub uh, have these numbers and I didn't cross refer when we do some kind of- uh, Yeah, so in GitHub, uh, issues get, are all numbered consecutively, but also pull requests get numbered. In GitHub, they share the same uh, numbering. So now we can see that there is an issue 38 and then 41. So what happened to 39 and 40? These are probably pull requests numbered 39 and 40. Mm -hmm. Should I push my change? Yeah, please. Let's do this. How was that again? It was git push origin and then the branch name. Uh, there was this minus u option upstream. Uh, how do you define that? And uh, how do you use in your workflow? Yeah, we have a we have we have this box on 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 that. So if you want to know how that works, I'll just scroll up here. Let's not get seasick. But this meaning of of dash u is explained here. In short, you can live a fulfilled life without using it, but it will it will help connecting the remote branch and the local branch. And then instead of typing git push origin or the one delta, I could. I could maybe just write git push and it will know what I meant to do. It will also give you a little bit more information than when you type git status, but here I left it out, it's not a problem. Let's push. And now I saw that something happened here. Where should I go next from here? So how do you, uh, uh, how do you create a pull request? So you have some information here on your terminal when you push the branch? Yeah, great question. So there are multiple ways to do it. One way is I saw that just by reloading the page, I saw that now GitHub anticipates that I, I might want to open a pull request because it, it noticed there is a new branch. I pushed it, I'm logged in, so I could do it from here. The other way is 
I can follow this link that I got. Both will lead to the same place. Let me open this one. And now, uh, now I'm about to open a pull request. Should I say which? What are the things that I look at when creating one, or what are the things that you look at when, before I click here on the green button? What are the things uh, that you normally check? I, I usually uh, would like to uh, give some uh, sh brief info about what I'm going to change, and if I'm working on a uh, issue. And it's mm -hmm. going. Uh, I will refer it either, either if I, if that's finished, if that work in the issue finished. I will use this uh, magic word clauses. Yeah. In my merge request, so then I don't need to go back and close the issue. It will, yeah. GitHub will, do it for me. Exactly. So, and what about you? And is there anything else you? So normally I make sure that this is. The title is descriptive because that will be the first thing people see. I also verify that it goes from the branch I want it to the branch I want it. So from this branch to this branch, this is what I want it. It tells me also that there won't be any conflicts. It's able to merge. I then also, before putting pushing the button, I normally scroll down here and look at what is it that I'm actually sending, what commits and what changes. Because if, if I see something here that I don't recognize, then I stop. So I normally verify that, is this really what I wanted to send? This looks really good. Mm -hmm. OK. And also, it's possible for you to uh, merge this into another branch that you already have in on GitHub, right? Exactly. I could choose a different one. It doesn't have to be master. And it suggests master because there's a default branch. Also, before clicking here, notice that you can choose between pull request and draft pull request. Why do you use, uh, why, when you sh one should use draft or work in pro progress merge request? It can be really useful when I want to notify that, you know, this is work, this is almost finished. Uh, I'm working on this. So I want to inform everybody. Maybe I want to collect feedback on something that is half finished before I finish it up and before it gets more difficult to implement the feedback. So it can be a nice way to collect feedback on something unfinished. OK, ready to go. Let's create it. And should we then change roles and you are the maintainer and you take the screen and review a couple of these pull requests? Yeah. So am I sharing the screen now? It looks good on my side. OK. So I am in this uh, centralized workflow exercise recorder that we are going to show it. And some information here. There are some issues and pull requests. And like 22 people uh, did some changes, and they want to merge it here. Shall we look into this pull request? Maybe we can merge your changes, Radovan. Let's do that, but maybe a practical question first. But should now all the other maintainers, should they do the same thing? Should they uh, review their yeah. pull requests? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's a good idea that the team uh, who works together do it together with us. Uh, like uh, they uh, review the codes, uh, their collaborator uh, want to merge, merge and then uh, we do it for the stream participants here. OK. That sounds good. And also, for those of you who wait for a break, we we will take a break soon. So after this review, we will take a break before we go to the next next level. Yeah. That's good. Uh, we are a bit uh, uh, lagging, but we will catch up uh, later. So I, I see that there are pull requests and there are numbers. And which one was uh, yours, if I? Oh, uh, mine was 47. OK. Yeah. So I click it here. And I see that there is uh, something. But uh, checking for ability to merge. And it says the branch has no conflict with the base branch. But it's not the 
code review, actually. We want to see what is the change, or what change Radovan has uh, done. So we, here, there are some information about commit. There is only one commit, and there is a one file change. Shall we go and see? Uh, yeah. So Radovan says that this is a nice tool to have diff, uh, git diff in the terminal. Look like the nice. Yeah, yeah, of course, I forgot to actually put the link in there. It's only in the commit message, but uh, later, in the next exercise, we will see how can we make, how can we request changes to a pull request. Okay. Yeah, probably I could say that this plus signs and the numbers, these numbers is git, uh, give it for each lines and plus is that something you are, you have added, right? If you have deleted something on an existing file, how it should, uh, how it, how it will look like? It will be. Yeah, so the plus is, they are also a way to comment. If you click on yeah. it, you can actually add comments in there. Yeah. But I wonder whether I could... we have a pull request that removes and adds. Probably we can take it during the fork exercise and we can have Sounds it good. there. So if I want to ask where is the link, something, some comments, I just can ask. Uh, probably we will not go further about the suggestion here. We will uh, catch it up during the fork exercise. And for now, I see that uh, this is good and I can start review here. And I see the changes. Oh yeah, I see, I have already commented something. I could uh, delete the comment or edit the comment later. And now I can go back to the conversation. Yeah, maybe I could edit it. Uh, where is the probably uh, link? And this is. Uh... Yeah. So that's a good question. And later we will learn how can I now change my pull request. So maybe let's not merge my pull request because it's kind of unfinished. Yeah. Let's go to a different one so that we see how it looks when it's really merged. And maybe, I don't know, let's open. Let's call back to the to the beginning of time. Let's maybe do number three. Yeah. So that's um, yeah, some yeah, some quotes from a from a nice book. And same here, we could. Okay, that's some uh, nice quotes, and uh, we think it's a uh, good good to go. Good to go. So then, how do you how do we merge it? I usually go back further here conversation and uh, uh, click uh, the green button here, merge pull request. And how do you do that usually? There's, or do you start with the review here? Yeah, so I'm also looking what, what, what is what are the changes from which branch to which branch. Um, in the conversation, there can be more context. So yeah. there, there one can refer to an issue which is happening here. So then I could also read up of what was what was the yeah. intent, and then then we merge. Sometimes it's also nice to say thank you for the change, so that like more personal touch. But yeah, yeah, that's a good way uh, to do that. I always forget most of the time, but uh, it's a good practice to say thank you. Mm. And should we merge it? Let's merge it. And after we merge, I suggest we look at the network. Yeah, and we need to confirm merge here. Yeah. So there is a message pull request successfully merged and closed. Uh, let us go to the inside and net network now. You want to see that? Yeah, I think that will changed. be interesting because then we see, we will see the different branches. We will see those that have been merged and those that have been not merged. And here we also see that a couple of people are already helping us integrating these changes into master, which is nice. Yeah, that's great. So we have this uh, master uh, main develop line, developing line and this, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, different branches, uh, different, all collaborative, uh, collaborators are working on this. Should we go back to the, do you want to mention something here? No, I think it's all good. I'm not now looking at the collaborative document, whether any question needs to be raised, any like understanding question. 
but I think it looks all good. I think we are close to um, having a break, um, to have a, a break. And after the break, we will take this to the next level and we will yeah. talk about working. Yeah, that's uh, good. And uh, we, we could keep in time and we will merge it uh, during the break probably and our co team can merge uh, some of the pull requests and it, we thanks for the, all the pull requests and work for you have done we don't have time to go through everything yeah, and you all have now write permissions to this repository so you, everybody can help reviewing and browsing other people's changes and the idea is always that it's a different person reviewing than the person who submitted it and again the, the goal is learning it's not it's not so much gatekeeping it's that both people learn from each other so you can try that as well both for the centralized workflow exercise recorded and unrecorded help us reviewing other people's pull requests and the same things you can do in your teams mm -hmm. and also you can have the discussion as uh, we mentioned earlier with radovan's pull request uh, that if you want to have a request uh, like probably i should go there for a minute uh, like uh, saying something about mentioning. Maybe I could add some uh, someone like from our team uh, to put uh, have a conversation with others in the team. So you can mention with your username this, so they get, will get notified if they are not watching this uh, repository. And we will have we can have a good discussion on this uh, pull request here. Just wanted to mention. I think otherwise. Uh, is there anything from the collaborative document we want to take uh, here? Should I go here? I think it's all under control. They are answered. I think it's time for a break. Um, I suggest that we have a break until 15 minutes past the hour. So okay. slightly more than 10 minutes. Yeah. So then uh, we will, uh, what's the plan after that? After the break, we will look at the forking workflow. We will explain it briefly. The, the nice thing is we will not have to explain, spend so much time on explaining because many features will feel familiar already. But then we will again take half an hour for an exercise where we practice collaborating on a project where we do not have write permissions, mm -hmm. where we are not collaborator. Yeah. And also it's nice to mention here that uh, they can uh, delete the branch after mer uh, merging. Let me forget to uh, mention. Uh, and if after the pull request, also if you want to some changes, you can commit changes to the branch, and it will be added to the pull request. Right. Yeah, but we will come back to that. Yeah. In the next good. segment. Yeah, and good to go for a break. So everybody enjoy break. We will be back in eleven minutes from now. Okay. Thanks. I will show there. Uh, So welcome back. Um, uh, I hope this exercise went well with you and you can ask questions on the uh, collaborative document. But uh, before we go to further session, probably we could have a small discussion about this git commands when uh, which commands we use locally or which commands we need to have this to work to have this internet access. Uh, we have been learning uh, commands since the last two days. And now we were mostly working on this uh, uh, cloud space. So for you, uh, may I ask uh, Radovan, like which commands do you think that uh, like you can work with um, locally and which, is, uh, which commands necessarily need internet access? Oh, and I wonder whether it would be helpful if I go to beginning of today, oops. Uh, one comment from HackMD. Someone asked, is anyone working on merging the branches of the non-recorded repository? And I guess not because I see many there. So I will go do that. Yeah, and everybody can please help because you all have uh, write permissions also there. Okay. We wish we could review all of them here, but it would take too much time. Yeah. Okay. See you. And answering Tanya's question, if we go back to this concept, uh, really, the only commands that require a network and that do anything with the network is pull, fetch, push, and clone. 
Yeah, that's where we communicate with the uh, cloud space. Yes. So all the other ones, like if we create branches, create commits, uh, they don't they don't use any network. They stay on our computer. So did that answer the question? Was that yes, question? yes, yeah. that's good. Thanks. So if if suddenly internet stops working, or uh, or you are working on a plane, uh, you can still do most of the Git things. Just not uh, not cloning, not pushing, not pulling. Yeah. Thanks. Shall we move on to the next uh, session? Distributed version control and forking workflow. Let's do that. Please. Here we go. And here, looking at the time, our goal is we we explain this in five minutes, and then we start exercising. Again, we want to give you half an hour. The exercise is similar, but we will sprinkle a couple of additional uh, steps that are good for you to know about. For instance, how to how to modify a pull request if you get feedback on changes, or how maybe we will also see conflicts. How does a conflict look? How do how can we resolve conflicts in in code review, you you will maybe also notice that somewhere there there will be automated testing, a little bit hidden, but maybe you can find it. And next week we return to automated testing. But if you look at this image, it looks different than earlier today. There is still the central repository. There are still the blue boxes, which which are our computers. But now there are these green forks, and the forks are copies, but they live on GitHub. Or GitLab. Everything that we say today also works on GitLab. And here we will collaborate on a on a taco recipe book. So you can invent a new taco recipe. But we will collaborate in a repository where we do not have write permissions. So this time we don't have to change exchange our GitHub usernames. We don't have to add anybody as um, collaborator. The individual learners, they will find an exercise repository created by us. It's down here. And again, there is one recorded, one not recorded. The teams, uh, so the maintainer will set up a repository for their team, but not add any collaborators. You don't have to exchange any GitHub usernames. Sorry, from the HackMD uh, stream is still showing the HackMD, not the uh, lesson. Oops, um, that is not good. Thanks. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, thanks for pointing it out. Okay, so then hopefully it still made sense what we, <laughs> what we mentioned here. We are now on, I will scroll up, um, we are now on this page. And we will collaborate on a taco recipe. But in this exercise, our first step will be to fork it. And then we can all write to our fork. And we will send the pull request now, not within the same repository, but we will send the pull request from the fork towards the central repository. So that's change number one. So the fork is going to be our personal uh, space, not? Exactly. And uh, since we already had this intro talk about uh, the use cases, but if there is someone who joined a little bit later, could you uh, uh, say something about the use cases of when uh, it's needed to fork a uh, repository rather than like uh, some use cases in some big projects? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the use case is that with this mechanism, we will be able to set to propose changes to basically any repository on GitHub GitLab, which is public, and we don't have to we don't have to ask for permission to have write access, because for some projects that is not really possible. They don't know me yet, but I don't have to even ask them. I can create a fork. I can work on a fork. I can modify it to my liking, and then if I want to send the changes back. I can do I can do this without even asking for permission to be part of that central repository, and maybe over time they will then add me. 
So it's 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 a very typical mechanism for most open source projects that uh, where where the contributors don't know each other, they don't work in the same research group. Yeah, probably I could add that uh, when forking, um, it will not. I I would like to repeat that it will not auto sync uh, after you forking. After any development happened on the central uh, repository, it will not auto sync to the fork uh, repository on your uh, GitHub space. Yeah. And we will be doing uh, synchronize uh, after uh, during the exercise, right? Like if there is any changes after we fork, we will yeah. see how we can uh, update our fork. Yes, our plan is again to send a pull request, that's the goal of the exercise, but then we will again review these changes together. We will focus now on new aspects, but then we will together learn also how can we update our forks after all these changes have been merged, because they will then end up in the central repository, but then they will not be on my fork yet, because the fork is now an independent Git repository. Good. And I think this is a really good question that I wanted to also raise, like, why do we even create a fork? Why not just clone? Because I can, if it's a public repository, I can clone and work on my computer. But then I can't show my changes to anybody easily because they live on my computer. And, and the maintainer cannot pull these changes from me, from, from the laptop. So now I have backup, I can show them to somebody and we can use this nice mechanism to integrate these changes. And in this, when we, when working with forks, we actually work with two remotes. Uh, one is the central repository, one is our fork. And to Git, um, we can have as many remotes as you like, and we can give them names. We have already seen origin, but we cannot give them different names. And we, to Git, they are placeholders for a web address. So you can rename them, add them, remove them. And then you can use pull and push to communicate between these different remotes. There's a good question, HackMD number 98. Why is there a blue line from red square and blue square since the interaction with red is only via green? So why is there a blue line between the red between square and blue and, square? And the blue square? Just why is there a blue line from the red square and blue square? That was that signaled the initial clone. Mm -hmm. Wait a moment, but was that even a good idea to do? I think that's a good question. Maybe we should remove these arrows because what we what we have should have done instead, and what we will do in the exercise is that we will fork, and as this dashed green line, we create a fork. We will not. Ah, sorry. Now I remember what they mean. Huh. Okay, I will rewind. Um, I remember now what they mean. They they mean that when we later synchronize changes from here to here, one way of doing it is to pull from central and push to fork. But we will see that there is an e even easier way. Oh, now I wonder, are we ready to Send, send people into exercises. To, do they have enough to enough background? Um, I think one important thing, we are now in a different repository. So step out, make sure that you are not in, it shouldn't say centralized, it should say forking. When you fork the exercise repository and clone it, you will see that there is a taco recipe and your goal is to add more taco recipes. The um, goal for everybody is create a pull request, but there are some nice optional exercises on make a pull request and then make a change to your pull request. Another nice exercise is to try to create a conflict between two pull requests. And then there is a third, there is also something about testing, try to identify that. How are we doing? Do we have enough background now to how much how long will the exercise be? Half an hour? Yeah, that would be good if they are 
uh, done with, uh, within 20 minutes, what should they do? Look at the optional steps. So there are green boxes, optional steps. Um, after the exercise, please also take a few minutes break. And we will then return, review these, learn how to update forks, and discuss the big picture of what we have done today. And when are we going to be back from... So should we do the break after the exercise? Should we be here before the break? I don't know how to schedule these things. Hmm. That's a tricky question. Uh, should we come back uh, around uh, two minutes to 12 and go for a break and see the status of how it went? Uh, ask sounds good. something. That yeah. sounds great. So exercise, everything up to pull request, in, but you can also look at optional exercises. And we will be back shortly before the hour. And ask questions on the collaborative document. Okay. Good luck, enjoy, and bye. Thanks. And welcome back, everybody. We have a little bit over 20 minutes left. There is a lot we want to still show you. We will try not to speed up, but focus on the essence. Okay. Here Thanks I'm to looking at, oh, go ahead. Thanks to all the pull requests you have uh, put in the central branch. So should we go for go and merge it? Yeah, so we have we got a couple of requests. You have maybe as a as a participant, you have maybe noticed that now you cannot merge them because now only the maintainer can merge them. So let's look at them and let's merge them here together. Uh, some of them. We will then later follow up on all of them. So we will comment, but here let's let's look at a couple of them together where should i start maybe you can start my uh merge request rather than it's uh, okay. and you see that i have changed later my pull request description or oh the title changed yeah yeah that is it. so this this title can be edited yeah Mm -hmm. And also, I have an issue uh, which I, I was working on this pull request, but I forgot to add clauses, uh, the magic word. So if you uh, merge it and close it, now I need to go back to uh, the issue and close it um, manually. Yes. Yeah. So I was so wondering was, if mm -hmm. you can do it uh, here. If Yeah, we can do it. So what was the issue? Uh, do you remember? Should we have a look? Yeah, it, uh, it is the first, uh, like, a lot. Spicy taco recipe in issue yeah. number one. one. Okay. Then let's do that. Back to your pull request. So one way to automatically close it is to add it to the commit message, which we didn't do, no problem. We can still add it here in, for instance, in the pull request title, and I think also in the description. Should we try? Yeah. So you could edit or... Because now I can imagine that. Yeah. So here we can if, if, uh, like, since you are a maintainer, uh, you know that there are some issues, and you see the pull request, and you see that there was this issue that's connected to this pull request. Mm -hmm. So the maintainer can uh, tag it here and close this issue if it's uh, finished with this pull request. Yeah. Should I do that? Merge? Yeah. Merge, and thanks for the spicy taco recipe. And let's also see what whether anything happened with the issue. So if I now go to the issue number one, it's closed. Nice. So it got automatically closed by the by the pull request number twelve. That's excellent. Where should we go next? Should we review a couple more? Yeah, and see that uh, what is uh, what does it mean with the tick mark and. Uh... Oh yeah, what is this? These green check marks yeah. and uh, the red cross, that's a new thing now. And what does that mean? We have added here automated testing without introducing it because we will talk about it next week. We have a full session on this. So every time here when somebody opens a pull request, we have an automated test running, which can help the 
maintainer to decide whether this is working. Of course, this is now here we do a taco recipe and the test is actually a very silly example. If you are interested what it what it is, but more about it next week. So there is a script called test pie and all it does, it verifies whether your recipe contains the word taco. And it's it's run with a GitHub workflow. And you can have a look in there, but we will have a full session on this next week. But this can be a really helpful tool for the for the maintainer. I would like to show a few more things here. One, let's do some more merging. And those of you who who are the maintainers, you can merge with me to get a couple of these changes merged because we want to get few changes into the central repository because in a moment we want to practice how do we update our forks low carb taco recipe i like the review is really similar to what we have discussed one hour ago i look at the branches the title the context often i scroll down and sorry i hear on file changed i look at what are the changes So here, three files are being changed, and it looks somehow good to me. I like it. I will also merge this one. Merge. And this file has modified. Um, it has also modified the cauliflower tacos file and changed this line in the dry pan to the open fire. In the meantime, I, I was working on a different pull request. This is my pull request where I do something else, but I modify the same line of the file in a different way. So instead of a dry pan in the oven, I'm currently completely unaware of the other pull request which just got merged. I will open this one. And what I'm hoping to see is, I wanted you to see how a conflict looks. Here it is. This pull request is now conflicting. How come? Resolve conflicts. Because in the in the earlier pull request, we changed dry pan to open fire. And now I changed dry pan to oven. And here we need to decide. And what we wanted to show you is that you can work on conflict resolution. This is something we have been discussing, was that on Tuesday? Uh, you can do that in your web interface directly in GitHub or GitLab. But I will not spend more time on this. What else should we talk about? Oh, probably uh, how to make uh, changes after a pull request. Yeah, that's a great question. So what, uh, which one should I pick up? Let's go here one by one. Um, so one way is if I'm if I'm happy with these changes, then then I can uh, I can just merge them. But what if I want? So what is a mechanism if I will if I suggest if I have a suggestion for a change? Yeah, let's go. Oh, we have a conflict as well. Yeah, this is because I merged the other one. I want to keep it now simple. Let's go to the next. Here we go. So one one thing I can say is that this is this is very nice. Thank you. Oh, but I have a suggestion. Here is an idea. There is an idea. There is an idea. There is an idea. How can how can the person now implement the suggestion? Should the person now close the pull request, make a new branch, make everything new, open a new pull request? No, there is a better way. So what's the what's the mechanism to for the um, for the submitter now to make changes to the open pull request? The how, how do you do it? Uh, I would uh, go to my branch and uh, make the suggested changes and push it. 
and that's the key because uh, pull requests are always from from branch to branch and if we add new commits to the same branch so if i push additional commits to the taco margarita they will they will show up here and they will get added to the pull request so that's that's one way of uh, making changes sometimes i request a tiny change um, Well, what if I want a very very small change to a, to a code? I could ask for it, but there is also a nice mechanism to suggest the change directly into the into this div. Here on plus, there is this plus minus, and I can put a suggestion directly into into the change, and it will make it easier for both of us to accept it or reject it with a mouse click. The other person doesn't have to go to the terminal, create a new commit, push the new commit. So this can be a nice way to, if you see a typo, to, to suggest the change directly. All right, now I'm also looking a bit at the, at the collaborative document. Feedback template is already there. Please add your feedback for today. We still have a little bit over 10 minutes. What should we do in this remaining time? Oh yeah, we forgot. Ha. We have something to talk. Yes, that's important. And maybe I should merge a few more things just to have a few more files. Pineapple steak, why not? Let's merge this as well. So that's very important because now on the on in our central repository, we have now a couple of nice recipes, but they are not in my fork. If I look into my fork, and here I'm on the fork, I don't see all these nice recipes. I only see the cauliflower tacos. So how do I get them from the central to the to my fork? How do you do it, Tanya? Uh, I will pull again. Uh, the master branch uh, to my local uh, repository. Yeah. It pull origin. Uh, instead of push, I will do git pull origin master. Exactly. So the, I want to show you where to find it. And I encourage everybody to also try it. So in updating forks, one way is this way. And I think maybe this is what you do. You pull the changes from the central repository, you push them to your fork. That's one way. You can test it out. Also, hmm? And also the fork uh, on a web page, it's like uh, auto sync, fetch and merge or something. Somewhere I see auto sync or something like that. So you go and click there and your fork will be updated as per the central repository. Exactly. So uh, let me try that because that will take really just two seconds. Here I'm on my fork and there is the sync fork. I want to synchronize it. This branch is out of date, update it. And now I get all these nice recipes. So now my fork is the master on my fork is up to date. Does it say somewhere? It should say it somewhere here. This branch is up to date with the other repository. So I encourage you all to try it. And also it's a good practice to update uh, the master branch every time you start any new development. Great point. And we like to at least close this section here with, uh, with the Luke Skywalker congratulating, oh, uh, Ben Kenobi congratulating Luke Skywalker that now we could, we got a glimpse of the Git remotes and we took our first step into a larger world. Oh, yeah. What do we do now with the remaining 10 minutes? Uh, There's we... a question, our idea I got from HackMD, uh, the collab document that, what if someone did not have time to do it, this exercise right now, but would like to do it later, uh, can they still do it on these repositories? And can we 
follow them, maybe merge some things later also? Yes, that's a great question. It got a similar great question got asked earlier. So one thing you, one thing you can do is team up with somebody and uh, work on it together. But if you cannot, we you can still send these pull requests. In fact, I will get email notifications. So now after this work, after today, I will open up my inbox. There will be many notifications and I will go through them. And um, then we can give feedback there. We can get things merged so that you also get to practice then updating the fork. We will not immediately destroy everything here. Uh, in in a week or two, then, then I will remove really the exercise repositories. Probably it is also nice to say that uh, anyone can contribute to the quadro final repositories if you think that there is something we should improve for the next time after learning this exercise. Uh, yeah, now you know how to, and now you yeah. know where to find it. And uh, there were so many good suggestions on how we should clarify the exercises and the more of this, less of the other. And then please send open issues, send us more requests. Let's change this together. This is how we develop these lessons. Do we have time to go into this, how to contribute changes to somebody else's project or should we more focus on other questions? No, I think, I think that would be good. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Marijn talked a little, a little bit about it earlier, but um, yeah, I guess we can summarize again. Yeah, let's do that. So what are good recommendations to avoid frustrations when, because now we know technically how to do these pull requests, but but in real life, it's more than one line. It can be many lines. It can be many weeks of work. How can we do this in a in a nice way? So if it's a if it's a very small change, um, how Daniel, Richard, Matthias, how do you how do you work with very small changes? Is this what you follow as well? Or do you have a different strategy? Yeah, I will always create branch and then push. Uh my changes to the center repository. My, I usually work with uh, or some organization and then we have, the, I'm, I am the collaborator, so I don't need to fork uh, that kind of workflow more often, but they're always uh, creating branch because I'm a bit afraid to uh, have some, um, in, destroy something. So it's mm -hmm. my workflow, creating branch and push, uh, make changes and push it into, and some of my colleagues yes. uh, review it. and. I, I hope that's the same way for you as well, right? Yeah, always for anything you create a branch, if it's about, um, so if this is supposed to be a pull request or merge request, why do we use here the two different names? Because, so on GitHub, it's called pull request, on GitLab, it's called merge request, but it's the same thing, same idea. And for anything new, a new branch. And the, the reason is we have seen that when we push additional commits to the branch, they get added to the pull request. And that can be really confusing if you don't create a new branch, if you send a pull request from your master branch. Because then you open a pull request and you think that, well, that, that was it. I can continue my other work. And then you continue your other work, but now that your, your new work gets also added there to everybody's surprise. What if you see a problem like in, in our lesson or in our code and so you observe an issue, a problem, you have an idea how to fix it. How, how do you do it? If you want to fix it, you can assign it uh, yourself or uh, suggest the changes there in the issue if you don't want to work on it, right? Yeah. Because it's good to, even if you, maybe you don't have time to work on it or you don't know how to solve it, but it's still nice to inform our other people about the problem instead of keeping it to myself. Um, if this change takes three minutes, sometimes I don't bother opening an issue, but if, if, I, if I see that this will take me a week or two, I open the issue, I say that I found this, um, I have an idea how to fix it, I describe the idea, and I collect feedback, and then I go in and code, code really. The same, same reasoning is if you have if you have an idea for a new feature, it can be useful to first describe what you plan to do, 
before you write 20,000 lines of code because it it hurts when you spend half a year writing code you send a pull request and then and then the pull request is not merged it's closed because it didn't fit into the project because it's, it was already there in a different way because we didn't communicate communication can save this kind of frustration and again it will also help me uh, navigating a larger project because i can in the feedback people can tell me yeah this is a good idea but please add it to this file not to the other file discuss and get feedback yeah and uh, i also would like to work on the latest uh, uh, master branch rather than the uh, old that uh, repository i have on my laptop computer is the most important uh, yes you mean before before starting on something new yeah something new yeah. something new features yeah so any new feature like actually before i create a new branch i update main or master so that i start from like a recent starting point good very good advice and we talked about work in progress and draft for you guys we have we have mentioned them if i get a lot of code pull requests with 10,000 lines of code. I will also want to know where does it come from? What is the license? More about licenses next week. Um, maybe you can ask, okay, the code is very nice, but how about documentation? How about testing? So all of this documentation, testing, licenses, reproducibility, we will look at next week. Is there any questions and the uh, collaborative document that we should take here before we close today? Yeah, actually, there was a good mention. Uh, so this question is, so in general, centralized workflow for one user and forking workflow for several user collaborators, or how is it? How do you see? Oh, centralized? I think we have... Yeah, we, we have centralized workflow for our code refinery team and the forks. What would be the forks for then? Okay, I could uh, give a use uh, uh, use case where I do these things. Uh, like I work with uh, code refinery and other organization, but I'm interested in some climate model development. And these people developed the model code. And at some point of time, I would like to do something if I have some time. And then I don't, I'm not a collaborator there. And I don't have right access to their uh, pro uh, repository. So what I should uh, do is I should fork it to my namespace, uh, to my GitHub space, then clone it and change uh, according to my features. Then push it and suggest this uh, to the maintainers on this big project, which I don't have uh, direct access. That's what, what we did for this forking exercise. And maybe Radovan, do you have something more to add? Any specific use case? So the question was about what is the advantage of having lots of branches in one repository or many forks instead? Uh, when I, I, I thought it was like when one should use the centralized workflow and forking workflow, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, use the forking workflow if you have to, because sometimes you don't have a choice. If you have the choice, start with the centralized one. It's simpler, you don't have to synchronize repositories. Uh, but maybe after a while, uh, maybe somebody will get a bit irritated that there are 20 branches, some of them are stale. So if you want, if you, if in your project it's important that you have a tidy repository with the main and release branch and every all the work in progress stuff is somewhere else then then you want to go to a forking and but, also, but it's a progression yeah also for the centralized workflow you are uh, you need to get access that how do we do it uh, today mm, for the forking uh, workflow you don't need to have that uh, you know you don't, you don't need to provide your username and all to the main data you can suggest the proposal would you say start with the simplest thing possible? Like a new project, you don't need to, like I would say you don't need to decide, okay, do we 
do forking, do we do this? No, you can start by making it see that it works and then slowly add the different pieces. So add other maintainers to the central repository who can push. And then when stuff gets more complicated, okay, so now we add in, we'll try to do most things by pull request because it's worth it. And we're starting to see problems when with chaos, when people are doing stuff unprotected. I know now we have people from the outside. We don't want to add everyone to this repository. Let's let the other people make forks and not be giving out access quite so much. So, not like, you know, the question is sort of what should be done, but you can also say do the minimum possible and always be increasing, and it can slowly. It's a sliding scale and you can add in each piece without radically recreating everything. I like that. Like we shouldn't try to make everything perfect in us and, and not not imitate big projects from day one. Because then it gets too complicated. Yeah. Get it good enough and then over time yeah. grow to different models. Yeah. So we're going a little bit um over time, I have some final comments I wrote down. So one, this is also someone wrote this in the feedback. But yeah, everyone will still need practice with what we're doing. So these things, I mean, these are quite complicated, big processes and systems we're building. So we've given you some experience, but you know, you learn it by doing it and talking with other people or reading the lessons later. And that's okay. Don't feel bad about it. Um, so ask for help. Um, so for people who are at a partner that's advertised the course to them, the people that advertise the course can probably help you with these kind of questions. So don't be all alone. For example, if you're at Alto University, we have a help session where we can help you any day and we're happy to get these kind of questions. Um, Maybe we can record some of these in the notes or in a follow-up mail today, whatever. Okay, um, so next week we are not doing basic Git things anymore, but now we then we'll start using Git. So you could look at it as next week is practical practice for what we did this week. So exercises, for example, testing or documentation, where you'll get to use Git a little bit more and see it, but we're also teaching you other things. So it's okay to come next week if you weren't here this week. So if you have friends that use Git or you think um, would be interested, you're definitely free to invite them for the next week. Um, what's IV? Oh, I also wrote down, do you have any requests for icebreakers, like people who you'd like to talk to or stories you'd like to hear? Let me know and I can invite them. Okay, that's all I had written down. Super, well then, thanks, thanks a lot, Tania. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks, everybody working on the background. Yeah. Thanks for all the pull requests. We will still go through them. The many good questions. Yeah. We also need to go through some. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you, Rado and Richard, Matthias, and all others who works behind the scene. And also all the participants and especially the volunteer helpers as team leads yeah. or where the it's a core refinery is all about uh, everyone. Yeah. And so. we hope that after this lesson, we will get more contribution from you guys uh, yeah. or us. Um, to yeah. do better on our LSS. Thank you so much. And yes. I hope everyone had a good day. Yeah. There, There's a comment here about couldn't get started because of access or SSH problem. So we're sorry about that, but the fortunately, once the day starts, there's very limited things we can do about installation access problems. Um, Hopefully you've still seen something useful and you can figure this out. I'd recommend talking to someone locally who can see your screen. 
but it also is a good point for next week we start using the conda environment in python so you really should look at the installation instructions again and do the verification because if it's not ready by then there is some new stuff and if it's not ready things will get behind very easily also okay mm. yeah and we'll we can keep answering this feedback and any other questions so we're a bit over time so should we go or should we answer more I guess we can go then. So, yes, thanks a lot, and see you next week. See you then. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye.